Hello everyone. Um, it's Sunday once again, and um, it's now two o'clock. Uh, just going, uh, yeah, it's thirteen fifteen. Well, nearly two o'clock in the afternoon in the UK, uh, which means it's nine p.m. in Manila. Um, welcome to another episode of Ask the Drummer. Um, this week's episode. Oh my God. I'm really so excited about this week because um, my guest uh, today is so, I mean, simply put, he's so incredible, it really is. Um, he's drummed in and drummed for like billions of bands and artists. Um, and he's released like seven albums as a solo artist. Um, he's also produced countless albums and eps he's got his own um recording studio as well it's like unbelievable and he's written a book which is just amazing absolutely amazing and he's only just 51 so last night i was all like thinking how am i going to ask him all about this in just an hour so <laughs> um hopefully we can do that today but um so i guess i better bring him in um uh, bring him in now. So, my dear friends, please welcome to Ask the Drummer, Steve Smiley Bernard. Hello, Smiley. Hello. <laughs> How, How are, are you? All right. I'm all right. I'm very right. well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Smiley, have you always been called Smiley? <laughs> yeah, it's something I got saddled with very early on, and so I had to had to be happy all the time but naturally i'm quite a happy person anyway so it kind of goes hand in hand it's a it's a nice name well you, you do look like you're, you're a happy person which is always you know good to know it's like uh, i love smiley people always. <laughs> yeah. so um what's a oh my god i'm so like my head is so like a bit of um like i've told you before that i'm really nervous because of all these things that you've done it's just so incredible right. but don't um, be nervous first... don't be nervous i don't, I don't buy it <laughs> well the first time and actually the only time i've seen you um play drums was um in 2016 it was march 2016 uh with the alarm and you were it's at um right. uh, the apollo in manchester and you were supporting the stranglers right. Now I will never forget. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I remember. yeah, I will never forget that gig because that was actually the only time I felt for my life. I felt really so like for I was because um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think what happened was um, during the alarm set, um, the moshing got a bit too much, and I was right at the. Oh room. right, okay. And I got crushed. Right. It was just too much. No. And, yeah. And this was just the alarm, the, the alarm set. I mean, oh, man. I thought I should have yeah. been I should have been like Bono at Live Aid and spotted you and kind of jumped in and <laughs> hugged you or something, you know. <laughs> so what happened was so after that, during the interval, I actually went to the box office and said, Can I go back? Can I go up to the balcony and just watch the stranglers from sort of like from the distance? Because right. I was all sort of like thinking it's gonna get worse when the you know when the stranglers don't yeah. stay. <laughs> there is there a scary crowd that stranglers crowd. Even I got scared and I was on the stage. <laughs> so that's that's what for me that's one of the most so sort of like unforgettable gigs ever. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. But um, yeah. But anyways, um, before we actually start, I want to say hello to Monty, Monty Mendigoria, who's watching us from the Philippines. Uh, I said hi, Anna. Hi, Smiley Mabuhai from the Philippines. Which um, actually, uh, Monty's show. It's all about new wave. Um, James Stevenson was on it, uh. and I remember asking. <laughs> He's been on everything. <laughs> 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 I, remember, I remember asking him because he played us a song because he's got a new album uh that came out i think right. at the time and 
he, he played one of the tracks and I, I remember asking him who drummed on it and then he said it was you and it was all like saying oh I've got yeah I've got to get him I've got to get him on us the drummer good album yeah, every, album actually about by then so is it it's out now isn't it yeah yeah it's a good album yeah it's worth checking out yeah yeah. Other side of the world, um, it's cool. Right. Also, um, want to say hello to Trevor Palmer from Skipton. He's watching. So hello, hello, Anne and Smiley. And Alvin John Santiago is also in Manila. I so, hi, Anna. Hello, Smiley. So, right. Um, anyways, welcome to Ask the Drummer. Um, episode 34 is all about you, Smiley. So um, we're going to start from from the very beginning. <laughs> so um, all right, okay. Yeah. So um, from Google, I found out that you were born in London in mm -hmm. 1971. Um, so Ish. showbiz age. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, Ish. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was it like um, growing up? in um london in the 70s because this is like this is like the punk era right in this is when it started where you yeah I, I think yeah when, when, if you were born in like early 70s um or late 60s you kind of just missed the punk era and I've, I've had this conversation because obviously of who i played for later in life everybody just assumed that i was a punk aficionado but i wasn't the, and and it's a really small window between if you were kind of 12-ish when punk happens or, you know, 10 or 12, you weren't appreciating it. If you were 14, 15, it changed your life and everything. So, so myself, I was just that little bit too young, really, for punk. I kind of followed it a little bit. I was in the next realm of the jam and, you know, stuff like that. So the actual punk explosion, I was a little bit too young. But it was nice growing up in London. Yeah, West London, very nice. And you've always been into music? Yeah, always. It was the thing. My dad was a musician. My dad was a musician and he, uh, and it, it, there was always guitars and, and things around the house. And I, I kind of started, I was one of those annoying kids who played drums when he was really young. And they used to wheel out at family Christmas get-togethers with a little drum kit and I had to play for everybody. It was just the only thing I was ever good at music. I was I, Until I found out I wasn't going to be a professional footballer or an astronaut, it was only going to ever be music, really. So, um, so yeah, and it's... Um, it, obviously, the thing is with music, you'll probably find with most drummers that um, they are musicians, you know what I mean? I think there's a, like this, 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 this kind of joke about oh he's just a drummer you'll find that most drummers you'll have on here are, are musicians and can probably play other instruments and think, yeah, yeah. They, they can write songs and you know and you'll probably find that's a common theme yeah so um but what got you because you said that you've been playing drums since you were a kid but what was there like a particular moment that you actually um, realized that this is what i'm going to do as a career as a career <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, I just think, I just as I say, I just, it was, it was just the, the one constant in my life from when I was a kid. I was always playing drums from the like in my high chair. Apparently, I used to kind of play along with the radio. My mum used to say, "I would play in time," and I was like really, really small. And it was just that, you know, like, some people just are destined to just do that thing. You know, if you're given a God-given yeah. talent. I think you can, you know, my dad, I remember my dad saying to me when I got to kind of 14 ish, <laughs> he said, um, he said, you need to play other instruments. And I said, oh, no, 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 man, I'm a drummer, I'm a drummer. He went, no, I'm serious. He said, you need to learn other instruments. You need to learn how to play the guitar and to play the piano and stuff like that because that will broaden your drumming skills. And he was right because you do learn through other instruments. What dr Drums are a, a very musical instrument, but they, they kind of, play off of other instruments if you know what I mean so I think you know with melody and stuff like that um so yeah I, I just I always did it from when I can rem remember there was never a time when I didn't have some sticks in my hand or something you know and did you go for um did you have drumming lessons or did you just sort of like 
I did, I did, I, I did. I um, my dad, my dad again. My dad is is just you know every every th the reason I'm here is because of my dad. My dad was great, but he um, he he he, uh, he found a a, a a jazz teacher, bizarrely, when I was in my early teens. And jazz jazz wasn't my thing, but I went and learned how to play jazz and played swing, and that kind of broadened my feel as a drummer yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's what that was the greatest and i never ended up playing jazz and i never ended up playing yeah. swing but it it, it 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 created my feel as a player and so that well, was great because it kind of took me out of my comfort zone really you know because um there was a film about drummers um it was on netflix um i think last year or two years ago and uh just found out there's actually a big difference between jazz drummers and rock drummers it was sort of like uh oh huge 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 like, uh, yeah so yeah. Um, it's, it's a massive difference it's, it's like it's like um it's kind of like sport it's it's like jazz drumming is like um if you if you think if you're a tennis player and you're a brilliant tennis player doesn't necessarily make mean you're a great table tennis player right good engine you know you're probably quite yeah. good at it because you've got that eye to hand coordination but it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean you're you're excellent at it and i think that's the the kind of thing with jazz drumming you're not necessarily like if you can play drums and then someone drops you yeah. into a jazz thing it's a completely different realm but it's really interesting and it's really good for your technique and stuff you know all the greatest drummers in the world ever were probably jazz drummers you know like Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and people like that, you know, yeah, yeah. regarded as probably the best players, you know. Yeah. So, um, can I ask, um, how old were you when you um, joined your first band? And what was oh, your gosh, first? Oh, gosh, I was young. <laughs> first proper <laughs> bands. I, I, I was only about 14 and I knew some older kids who were like, 18 and 19 through my dad and my god my dad like ran a youth club and um and these guys were really cool they were kind of 18 19 years old and i was only young i was very young kind of 14 and, and they asked me to play drums with them so i kind of grew up very quickly because i was kind of hanging around with these older guys and they were really nice guys as well you know they were they were cool yeah. and i'm still friends with them now they're, they're, they're still like my little close knit three little pals we zoom each other every week and everything so it's like it's amazing how much influence they had on my life because they taught me not only music but they taught me great people skills if you hang around with older people when you're about 14 it, it, it yeah. sets you on a good path because you bypass all the the stupidness you know the school stuff where you're you're dragged into <laughs> stuff you the learning stuff you know, but with these guys, they were like, nah, you don't want to do that. That's rubbish. We've done that. Don't do that. And you kind of go, oh, OK, I won't then, you know. So it yeah. kept me on the kind of nice straight path, you know. So how long did that last? And what was the name of the band? Ah, oh, that band was called, my oh God, uh, it was it was a Greek name. It was a Latin name. They were a band called Vox Humana, which is Latin for oh. human voice, I think. It was very, it was very yeah. based around U2 and, and bands like that. Ironically, it was based around the Alarm as well, which is ironic. So oh, I'm right. their drummer now. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's kind of, it's bizarrely gone full circle. It's very strange. Yeah. 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 But, um, so, so you're basically, because you were born like in 1971, so uh, you're basically more teenagers than like in the 80s. So were you into the new romantics or, yeah. you know, like... Uh, or what we call in the Philippines, new wave. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was, I London, was, I was very much so. It, yeah, in London they had this sort of like blitz, you know, it's like the blitz kids. Were you part of that sort of like scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, again, I wasn't really in the scene. I was kind of slightly on the outside of it. I never, I never committed because part of me wanted to be a mod because of the jam. Um, part of me wanted to be a new romantic because of Duran Duran. Uh, Part yeah, of me wanted yeah. to have interesting colours in my hair because of the Water Boys and, and and bands like that. And part of me wanted to be a bit of a rocker because of the Alarm and U2. So 
I was a little bit of <laughs> I wasn't in so one like... camp, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we saw like a unique it's all like combination of everything, you know? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, a bit of everything, yeah. A bit of everything. Yeah. 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 It never well, quite added up. It never never quite went down one route. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first um, band that I'm going to ask you is, is I find this really interesting because um, you were in the Mock Turtles. I was in the, the Mock Turtles, Turtles, yeah. Like, they, this is like a Manchester band. So yeah. when did you become involved with this? Or like, and they're part of the Manchester scene as well, weren't they? Uh, well, they were. Well, this is, this is where it all starts to get a bit weird because I was a I was in my uh, early 20s and I was playing in just loads of bands, but I had a day job. I was driving a van all day, just driving around and playing in bands every night. And the Mock Turtles were on the radio every day with their track, Can You Dig It? It's quite a famous yeah, song. Yeah. And I yeah. loved the song. And I loved the song. And every time it came on, I would turn this song up. And then I was playing a, a, bit, a gig in a bar in London somewhere. And they happened to be in this bar because they'd been in London the night before to be on top of the pops. And they were at the bar. And so the, so I was playing in this old, I don't know, like a blues gig or something. And, and their producer came up to me at half time and said, um, oh, you're impressing some quite important people over there. And I said, oh, who's that then? And he went, oh, it's the Mock Turtles. And I said, oh, well, man, I watched them on top of the pops last night. And he said, well, come and meet them. And I saw, and the first thing I saw was their singer, Martin Coogan, who's a very, very oh, cool yeah. guy. And, yeah. and he said, uh, hey, how you doing? And I said, oh, I said, you're wearing the same clothes as you wore on top of the pops last night. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I haven't been to bed yet. <laughs> and then we just became <laughs> friends. And then over a period of time, they, they had a drummer at the time, but then uh, he, they, they changed and then they came after me and that was it. And then I... I was in a band for about 10 years. It was great. I love that band. Really oh, cool. Oh, wow. Really cool. That's, yeah. that's just amazing because that, that's one of the things that I didn't know because I do love Can You Dig It as well. It was all like that. It's a brilliant song, isn't it? Yeah, it uh -huh. is a brilliant song. So finding out that you're actually so like, you know, in the Mock Turtles yeah. so like, and, and you said for 10 well, years. And, and obviously, yeah, and obviously I'm like now kind of, bit of Mancunian in me. I've got the Mancunian <laughs> walk because of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then from from um from um the Mock Turtles, you actually sort of, like became Robbie Williams, so like live drummer. So was yeah. that sort of, like yeah, that was, was a that... that was a trip. Yeah. So was that because of um being in the Mock Turtles that you become uh, was it Robbie Williams who chose you to be uh, his drummer, or how, no, how did that happen? No, not at all. That was um, I did I did something for someone somewhere. Sorry to be so vague. And then <laughs> I, I can't I can't even remember what it was. It was just like it's a, a long time yeah, ago. It was yeah. a bit. It was just a yeah. It was it was just a session for somebody. Um, and then at the end of the day, I remember saying what do you guys, you know, do? And they said, oh, we write for Robbie Williams. And, I was, and he just left Take That and he just started his solo career. And I was like, oh man, I love Robbie, he's ace. And then, and then I got a call from an agent who said, uh, do you want to audition for Robbie? And I said, oh yeah, man, that'd be great. How many drummers are there? And he said, uh, 26. And I went, oh wow. And I said, what number am I? And he went, 26. And I was like, <laughs> You gotta be kidding me, right? Now this is so, so. This is where, this is where the gods shine on you occasionally, right? In life, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I went to that audition. I went to that audition, and I was the twenty-sixth drummer to walk in the door. And when I walked in the door, Robbie walked in the door, right? Just by chance. He hadn't been there for the rest of the day, so yeah, he yeah. came in. Everybody, everybody went, yay, Robbie. And he went, hey, and he was really up. And he said, let's do this. Who's the drummer? And I went, oh, hi, how you doing? And he went, let's do it. And we smashed out a few songs. And it was a really great vibe. And because he was there, I think I got it. And that was, 
yeah. and I was with him for about uh, a year, a year, a bit longer maybe. And I did a load of recording with him, did some tours with him, became really good friends with him, and then yeah. got an in an insight what it was like to be behind a very famous person, which was very interesting. Well, I've got I've got to say, uh, I'm still a bit so like bitter or maybe hurt because he's the one who split up take that <laughs> so yeah he's never been forgiven no he's never been forgiven robbie is he how dare you rob <laughs> i remember when um i think it was february 1995 i'm i'm not too sure about the date now when um gary barlow so like came on national tv and say that take that and no more I was one of the girls who actually oh, yeah, cried when when they found out. No, was you weren't really. <laughs> 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 that's what that's what I thought. Um, Robin Williams, no, I'm not. <laughs> but to be honest, do you know, do you know my uh, my. Yeah, by that. Um, I'm not seeing them live. I should I should go and see take that live someday. But no, I was oh, like. <laughs> well, I didn't know you were a take that fan. Do you know my my greatest claim to fame with that is? Um, do you remember Robbie started doing like a punk version of Back for Good? Do you remember yeah. that in his live set? That was that was yeah. my idea. That I I suggested oh that for a laugh, and we did it. We did it at a uh, we did it at the Princess Diana Memorial concert in Battersea, and we were on a. And Gary Barlow was on as well. And, and that was when Robbie and Gary didn't get on. Oh, right. And I said to Rob, we, we, should do, we should do a version of Back for Good in the punk style the, and not tell yeah. him. And we did. And he, and he carried on doing it for years. I think he still does it now. So that was my, that was my idea, that one. <laughs> but I love Robbie. Rob, Robbie's fan. No, he's great. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's, he's nice, but... <laughs> but he's I'm lovely. Still, I, I'm still sort of hurt and then also yeah. um you need to forgive him you really need to yeah. forgive him <laughs> and the thing is so like that was 1995 and then a year later in 1996 the stone rose was split up and i was like that's my manchester dream shattered oh, that was, that was that's it that's manchester's finished yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's it then, and then so, luckily um, oasis swapped in you're all right <laughs> but anyway, so um, from the Mock Turtles and Robbie Williams, you played and you um, jumped for so many bands and like artists. And I'm not even going to mention all of them because it's like when I looked on um, Discogs, there's so many names there and so many so, like, people. Um, but it's before I ask you about this one particular um, band, um, is there uh, any... any um, um band or artist that you played for or played in that you would like to share with us like a really nice memory of um uh playing with um, yeah it's is yeah, there I've, another I, I, I've, um, I've done there was i did i remember going to um i remember going to ireland for, for a for a, a week and i i recorded albums with um roy harper the really famous folk singer and yeah, yeah. noel redding of of the Jimi hendrix noel redding right and then it's a great story this years later um uh, the producer i saw the producer and he said um do you remember that session you did for for noel redding and i said yeah and he said well one of the tracks they found the original guitar part and I said, right. And he said, and it's Hendrix. He said, so technically, you're on a track in the Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> and I never heard it. I've, I've never heard the track. He said, oh, I'll send it to you. And he never sent it to me. So. Oh, no. So, yeah, there you go. I was in the Jimi Hendrix experience. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't think I can squeeze that on my CV, really. But, yeah. I know until some people who would. Well, until they actually release it, if they release it, then you would, you, you would be able to. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm, um, not, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put Jimi Hendrix next to Chesney Hawks on my CV. He just wouldn't look right. <laughs> well, that's another one. You, um, Chesney Hawks. Um, so. Oh, I love Ches. He's great. 
Yeah, because um, I, I met I actually met Chesney Hawks because he played in Stockport one time. And he's everybody he's loves popular. Chesney. He's the yeah. he's the most popular man in the world. Everybody loves Chesney. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous. So, yeah, yeah, he is. Oh, he still is. It really is gorgeous. And that song, I am the one and all. It was like, I remember I was in I was in the Middle East at the time when it came out. And I just thought, oh my god, uh-huh. he's so good looking. So yeah, that will always oh. be one of those. Yeah, he's he's nice, Justin Hills. But um, right, so um my tech support, who's aka my husband, he actually said that sound and pictures looking at A OK. So that's very good. Um and he also said that Eric Bell was with Noel Redding's band for a while. So that's the Eric Bell. Uh, so. All right. <laughs> but now we go to the part where I'm going to ask you about this uh being involved in uh, Joe's trauma and the Mescaleros. Now, yeah. okay, um, John Kidd um, wants me to ask you: Have you got any Joe trauma stories uh, that you'd like to share with us from your time in the Mescaleros? Um, I, I think I think what I remember most was how famous he was within music, other musicians. So when we went to festivals, for instance, it was astonishing how many people wanted to get to Joe, right? And, and we've all done festivals with bands and all that. And bands, when you're in the backstage area, you kind of, everybody's the same, you know? So everybody speaks to each other and they're really nice. But yeah. honestly, every five minutes, it was like a knock at the door and he would go, Smiley, you go and find out who that is. And you go, all right. And then you just, you'd walk up to the door and go, hello there. Just give us one second. And you just go, it's Debbie Harry. And you go, tell her to give me a minute. And then, and then he'd be like, hi, over a sec. It's uh, two of talking heads. And it just, just went on, right? And then I remember we, I remember just as this is, for me, as, a, as if it's a drummer's show, this is the best story. We played we did the big day out festival in Australia in 2000 and there were other bands. The other bands on the tour were the Chili Peppers, Blink 182, Foo Fighters, Primal Scream. Right. And we played a show as the Mescaleros at the Sydney Metro. And in that crowd that night, as I was walking on the stage, we stood at the side of the stage and someone went, do you know who's here? And I said, no. And he went, Chad Smith, Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins, Travis Barker, and Darren Mooney are all standing over there <laughs> as I walked on the stage. Oh my. And we played, and we played, we played a load, <laughs> we, we played a load of class songs at the end. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. it was amazing, right? And it was, and as, and as I walked off, Chad Smith was standing at the side of the stage with his arms out, and just went, "Come here," and just gave me the biggest hug. And then oh Taylor my. was there, and. Dave Grohl was there, and it, that was, and I always thought that, that I'll never beat this night ever, because my best friend was there. My best friend's an Australian, and he was there as well. And he yeah, said, yeah. he said, oh, I've been hanging out with all these drum. Hey man, I've been hanging out with all these drummers in the bar, you know, some guy <laughs> oh called Taylor. <laughs> and it's like, oh so yeah, God. that was possible. That's possible. I always remember thinking. It won't get any better than this. I might as well stop now because that's the right. pinnacle, that's isn't it? You know? kind of drummer heaven. <laughs> that's yeah. drummer heaven. Now. That's what, that's but, what, yeah, drummer heaven. When we die, yeah. that's what it's going to be like. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, see, I will talk about um, Taylor Hawkins. That was really sad. Do you know what happened? Like uh, a week ago. Uh, yeah. So, and, and you've met you yeah, met him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was um, lovely. He was he was lovely. He was lovely. He was a really, really lovely. What you saw was what you got. That wasn't that. You know, sometimes you see a public persona, and then you meet him and say, "Oh, he's actually he was lovely. He was just a really. Yeah. He was like a hyperactive child bouncing around, and he was like that all yeah. the time. So yeah, God bless him, man. He's you know he's yeah incredible. And he man. was he was another smiler. I mean, he was all the photos, all the photos that you see of him, he was always smiling. He just looks so beautiful. Know. You know, it was like, um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, rest, rest in peace. Very Morgan. nice. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, anyways, we'll, 
Yeah, we have to say uh, greetings from Detroit, from Roel Marasigan. Um, yeah, so he's watching us from Detroit in America. And uh, John Kidd also, hi, Anna. That was his question earlier. Hi, Anna and Smiley. And he said, what a great story. Now, Trevor Palmer also wanted to ask you, how did you get to work with Joe Strummer? And what was he like? That was, okay, I got it. I got, again, it's like, I got the job. Somebody I was working with, with Robbie, went off to work with Strummer. And then there was a bit of a, Jed Lynch was doing Strummer. Do you know Jed Lynch? He plays with Peter Gabriel, amazing Strummer. Oh, and he yeah, was doing yeah, Strummer yeah. and then he got offered something else. So then they called me and I went in and I, I remember pulling up at the gates of this studio and I, I pressed the buzzer and, and, and they said, uh, yeah. And I said, oh, I'm here to uh, play with Joe Strummer. And the gates opened and he walked out and he, and he just, and I round down the window and he looked in and he just went, you must be the kid. He said, I'll see you inside. And I was like, wow. And there he was. And honestly, he was, he was so cool. He was so cool. And he, and I tell you, the other thing about Strummer that he was so intelligent. He was like, you know, I know there's this kind of whole punk ethos and he was a rebel and all that. He was so intelligent. He was really well read and he was really compassionate and generous and and all the great superlatives you can think about for a person, give them to Shoma because he was a dude, man. He was, I loved him. He was great. Yeah, because, um, well, the um, Ask the Drummer, so like subtitle or subheading, it actually says um, a band is only as good as its drummer. I, I thought it was um, uh, a quote from um, Bobby Gillespie, but I found out uh, last year or two years ago that it's actually originated from Joe Strummer. It was him who originated. Is it really? Oh. Yeah, it was him who well originated. Done, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that a band, a band is only as good as its drummer because he said that no matter how good the band is, if the drummer is falling apart, then the whole yeah. the whole band is is going to so like fall apart. So the drummer, yeah. the, the, the drummer is easily the most important member of the band, and the coolest, and the nicest, and the coolest member go. of the rock. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's just so amazing because when you, when you think of Joe Strummer, I always think of sort of like the clash in in the words that say the only band that matters. That's that's probably sort of like the thing that I always think of when I when I when I think of Joe Strummer. And it's amazing that you actually sort of like played with him, and you have all these memories. Yeah, of he was great. Like, you know, yeah, it's, it's incredible. He's amazing. Yeah, um, but now we sort of like move on because because I know that you're at the moment you're in in Edinburgh. You just arrived from Glasgow. You were in Glasgow last night um, yeah. for uh, yeah. a gig with, with the Alarm, and you're doing a gig tonight as yeah. well um, in Edinburgh. So um, yeah, how did you get into how? When did you join the Alarm? Well, now this has got a Joe Strummer tag to it as well. Back in about 2009, 10, I got asked to do like a Joe Strummer tribute thing. Uh, myself, Pablo Cook, who was in the Mescaleros. And then we had Derek Forbes from Simple Minds on bass. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then we had Gary, Gary Newman's guitarist, Steve Harris. And we tried a couple of front men to front it. And no one could really stand up to Joe Strummer, obviously. And then someone said... Well, look, if you could get anybody, who would you who, who would you go for? And I said, well, someone like Mike Peters would be brilliant, but I don't know him. And someone said to me, I know Mike Peters. I could get you his number if you want. So, you know, I I just I just emailed him and just went, I know you're a big fan. Do you fancy doing it? And um, and he's like, yeah, love to. So we we went on tour, and then um. I just used it as an alarm audition, the tour, to get in the alarm. <laughs> and then I got really, I became really good friends with Mike anyway. And then I knew, I knew the opportunity would come up. And then one, the drummer with the alarm couldn't do a show. And I said, I, I'll do it. And that was it. The rest was history, really. So. But have you always been a fan of the alarm? Have, uh, yeah. Have yeah. Always? yeah. Yeah. So, always. Always. Yeah. Always. And he is... 
he he's a force of nature. He's the closest. He's the closest one to Joe I've ever met, Mike, as a person and as an entertainer and as a front man, like yeah. with people in the palm of his hands. Mike Peters is, is the greatest front man ever, in my eyes. Image yeah. drummer. And then Robbie. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what order in, but yeah. You put them in order, but you put them in your own order. There's your favourite three. You pop them in your order. Yeah. You're right. going to say Robbie three because you hate him. <laughs> because you haven't forgiven him. For you need to forgive. <laughs> yeah, I will do. Oh my God. Well, right. well, you do know that, that the alarm are actually very, very big in the Philippines. And um, I just want to. Yeah, ask we played you, in Manila. Did, we played in Manila. I was going to say, did you actually go with the alarm when, when they played in Manila? You were there? You, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, God, so loved it. it. Absolutely like? loved it. It was amazing. We did we did two shows. One of them was at an arena. But I remember I remember coming out of the hotel and we had security with us, which I couldn't understand why. And the and this security guy kept talking into his wrist, going, The band are coming out, the band are coming out. And he was like this great big I thought, this is brilliant. I've got a security man. And he uh, <laughs> I said, Can we go for a walk? And he said, he said, We can. He said, We can go left. But we can't go right. And I said, uh, why is that? And he said, well, we'll drive right and I'll show you why. And it was like, it was the scariest thing I've ever seen. It was like, it was like the Bronx. Yeah. And then we were like, oh my God, this, where is this place? And then we went left and it was like, it was just paradise. And we went to the sea and the ocean. And oh, I love Manila. It's a brilliant place. I want to go back. Oh, that's, that's so good. Because, um, Remember when I saw Mike Peters in um, last year? I went to see him at Wax and Beans when he was promoting a, a, an album. Um, he yeah. actually said that um, the promoters told him that they have to sing the most famous, so like the alarm song in the Philippines. Yeah. And then when he asked me about <coughs> it, I yeah. actually gave him the wrong answer because he was he was expecting me to say it's um, absolute reality. But then I said the rain in the summertime. <laughs> and I just thought it was really, oh, really? funny. Yeah, because rain in the summertime is actually my favorite. That's why I told him that. But yeah, the most famous oh. one is um, absolute reality. And, and he said that he really loved, he loved playing it because I think absolute reality is not really the most popular here in the UK. Yeah. Um, but in the in Manila, no, in the Philippines, not. yeah, in the Philippines, that was really good. Mm. So, uh, are there are sort of like plans of the alarms or like going back to the Philippines when you know, like I mean, COVID when when COVID is sort of like when everything is okay to travel again and stuff. Are there any plans yeah. in the future? Uh, Maybe. Uh, I don't know if there is at the moment. I hope so. I hope so. I'd be there in a shot. I loved it over there. I'd love, I want to go back. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll ask him later. I'll ask him later. Yeah, yeah. Um, Royal Myers Segan um, in Detroit, he said that hope to see you back in Motown soon. So, yeah. He's... Yes. Love it there. Love it there. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Next year. Next summer, apparently. Yeah. And... Trevor said that he used to have an alarm haircut. So that's probably sort of like this long go. <laughs> well, the one that went up. Yeah. See, see Mike, Mike's, Mike's, <laughs> Mike's still got the most amazing hair, but all he did is instead of going up now, it goes down. And it's still, <laughs> it's got this monstrous lion mane. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So um, the tour is going to last until uh, mid-April. Right, so because I'm gonna yeah. go and see you in um, in Manchester on the fifteenth. Um, so there are other sort right. of like uh, places that you're um, gonna be playing um, in Alarm. So tonight is Edinburgh, and where are the where are the places are you going to go after after Edinburgh? Uh, uh, after Edinburgh, we're going back to Wales for two days. Then we're going to Leamington Spa, and then we're going to Exeter. Sheffield, Brighton, Cambridge, Manchester, Northampton, Bristol. Oh, it's, you, you Lord, it yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll see I'll you in Manchester. Yeah, I'll see you in Manchester. But um, actually, um, right. 
Yeah, I forgot to say that before you went on the alarm tour, you were also in, involved in Tony Visconti's Best of Bowie uh, tour. Now, this yeah. is really, I've got to yeah. say this, because uh, my husband who's listening right now, he's a big fan of David Bowie. And he would have loved to sort yeah. like um, seeing you know Tony Visconti's Best of Bowie so like gig, but he's still not into um, going out and you know mingling with. Oh, is he people. not? Oh no, because he, he that still, he's still worried. That, yeah, that... He's still, yeah, yeah. So how was that? How was how was that tour? And um, that, also, well, that was amazing because did... because um, um, sorry, yeah. well that came up. That 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 came up quite suddenly because I went to see the the, the best of Bowie thing when it was called Holy Holy. I went twice because James Stevenson obviously is in it, and I went twice to watch it and I loved it and I met I met Woody Woodmansey and everything and it was like wow you know a bit of hero worshipping, and then I heard a rumor going round through James that um, Woody he wouldn't get vaccinated, so. Tony Visconti said, well, if you're not vaccinated, you're not coming on the tour. And there was a little yeah. bit of a... So then I so I said, jokingly, to James, I'll put my name in the ring, James. I'd love to do that. And he went, yeah, 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 OK. And then, and then he said, oh, I think Clem Burke's doing it. And I said, oh, well, I'll pay to see Clem Burke doing Bowie. So then, yeah. I, did, and then I didn't think anything more of it. And then suddenly, out of the blue, I just got a phone call. And it was the tour manager saying, basically, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And he went, right, you've got three weeks to learn it. And then after th I learned everything for three weeks, I literally did nothing else. I just learned these Bowie songs. And then I went in on the Saturday and into rehearsal. And there was Visconti. And he is a ledge. He's an absolute legend. Yeah. There he was yeah. right in front of me. And I kind of went, hello, Tony. He went, hey, man, how are you? And I was like... Oh my God! I'm so glad I've learnt this, and then um, and then just proceeded, proceeded to realise that after three days rehearsal, Tony Visconti, he's not a complimenter. He doesn't say anything to you unless he wants you to change something. So he didn't say anything in the rehearsals, and I was saying to the others, "Is he, is he happy?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, he's really happy." So then we did the first show, and he just nodded and smiled and gave me a hug, and I thought. Is he happy? And then on the second day of the, sh of the tour, he said, um, hey, can I just have a quick word? I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, just two things. Uh, the width of the circle is just a little bit fast, but don't, you don't start that. So I want you to pull that back. I went, OK, yeah, cool. And he went, and the man who sold the world needs to be a little bit faster. And he went, that's it. And that was his way of telling me everything was fine. And um, and that was it. So from there on, I just tried to get as many Bowie stories out of him as I could. So uh, he's a dude, man. Tony Visconti, he's a proper... I, 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 was like a, I was like you are with Gary Barlow. I was just like that. <laughs> wow. It was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. So, yeah. yeah no, no. It's great being a fan when you're in a band. <laughs> That's actually that's incredible. We are actually talking about as if you were like also like I I consider myself a fan girl. So like every time I see bands and you know like musicians I love. Yeah. But hearing you talk about Tony Visconti as well, I was like, oh my god, he's also oh. a fan. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and I've said this before. I've said this before. There aren't actually that many legends. If you actually scratch the surface and. And when you yeah. write the word legend, right, usually, obviously, a legend is when someone passes away and then they either get lauded as a legend, you know, you're David Bowie or John Lennon, Kurt Cobain, Joe Strummer. Yeah, but yeah, there aren't, yeah. but living legends, do you know what I mean? <clears throat> Actual living legends. But from a producer point of view, Tony Visconti is a legend, man. He's like, he's the, he's, when, it, when he does finally die, and trust me, it's not going to be for ages because he's fit as a fiddle. But he'll yeah. he'll he'll be you know he'll go down as one of the greatest top three producers probably of all time you know like and he was playing bass next to me I just uh, there's loads of photos of the tour where I'm just kind of lovingly looking at him like wow <laughs> so disgusting so so for it so for every fan in the crowd there was a fan yeah. on the drums as well. It was a at him, you know. 
<laughs> well, of course you'd know that because you're a producer yourself. And because yeah. you produce so I, so I tried many... to nick loads of little things off him. So. <laughs> so, and you've got your own recording studio um, called yeah. Sunshine, Sunshine Corner in Hampshire. Sun, Sunshine, yeah, Sunshine Corner Studios in Hampshire, um, which if anybody wants to come along, just go on the website, Sunshine Corner Studios. But that's been great. I've enjoyed being a producer. I kind of anointed myself as a producer about 15 years ago and then realized I had to actually become a producer. But then the more I did it, because I stolen everybody's ideas and every time I went and did a session in a studio, I stuck around and I watched the producers and I watched what they did and I, you know, yeah. learned from them. Still do now, still do. If I go and do a session, I'll stay around and watch how they do it. So with Visconti, yeah. I was nicking, I was asking him little tips about when you record a snare drum, you know, and that kind of rubbish. Um, so yeah, I've actually got quite good at producing now. So yeah, I've, I've, I've produced loads now. It's great, love it. Yeah, and um, apart from producing, you also a solo artist as well. Because um, the one thing that I found out on yeah. Google last night is Smiley's Friends. So that's actually yeah. you as a solo artist, and you've released seven yeah. albums so far. I have, I have indeed. Yeah, they're all on Spotify if you want to check them out. Smiley's Friends <laughs> or Smiley, one of the two. That's amazing. And then looking at all the list of Smiley's friends, you've got Ian McNabb. <laughs> um, let me just sort of like uh, check, because I've actually written it down. You've got uh, Bruce Foston of The Jam. Yep. Uh, Steve, yep. Steve Norman as well. So all these people are actually... Spandau so Ballet. Awesome. Yeah, I know. Spandau I know. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, these, these are all people I've probably worked with at some point. And I got, I got to the point where it's amazing. It doesn't matter how famous these people are. If you ask them to be part of something musical and they like it, they'll say yes. Right? It's just, you probably get one chance. Like Bruce Foxton was amazing, right? Because I was playing him from the jam with him. So I got to know him really well. And he's, he's Bruce Foxton. He's, he's another absolute legend. And and just yeah. a very quick story. Yeah, so a quick story with Bruce Foxton. So I asked him to come and play on a track for me. And he said, uh, after a lot of deliberation, my I add, he said yes. So he came in and we sat in the studio and I'd sent him the song and he'd learnt the song. So I said, well, you ready to go? And he said, yeah, OK, let's press record. So he sits there and, and he's here, right, playing Bruce Foxton on my song, right? So when it got to the chorus, the chorus went to a B minor and an A, right? So Bruce Foxton kept, keeps playing this F sharp note. And I was a bit, that's a bit weird. Why is he playing F sharp? And then he finishes and I said, oh, that's amazing. I said, do you want to do one more, one more run through? And he does it again. And he keeps playing this F sharp, right? And I said, um, I've got to ask you a question. He said, what's that? I said, uh, well, the chorus goes to B minor and you're playing an F sharp. And he went, yeah. And I went, why? And he went, because I'm Bruce Foxton. <laughs> and I went, fair point. So I said to him, well, OK, let's do that. I said, and then the bit at the end, Bruce, where it goes to the outro, could you play a D instead of a B minor? And he said, um, why? I said, because I'm Smiley and it's my song. <laughs> and, he, and he said, fair point. So, so he did. And that was how I got to it. So, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Oh I had to God, myself so a little cool. bit. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. I'm still starstruck. <coughs> <coughs> Bless him. Oh, I'm really enjoying this. Now, I've got, I've got to sort of like say, um, so uh, you're currently doing the alarm, but after the alarm yeah you're gonna go on the gene loves jezebel tour which also starting so like later on this uh this month now, do you ever go yeah. to sleep <laughs> no, I, think, I think i think my family are so used to me being away because i was at home for two years they're kind of yeah off you go i've been away 
for a few weeks now. I have to chase my wife and I chase my kids to kind of go, hello, I'm here. And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, they don't even know where I am. So, no, it's great. The, uh, these these two has felt, this bizarrely, like the Bowie one, then the alarm, then Jean Loves Jezebel, all fell right behind each other. So, literally, it's, it's two months right straight through with all three bands and then um and then the next big one is archive go out for two months in the autumn so that's good doing 40 shows yeah, that, so that's gonna be cool yeah, yeah. so really really busy so like busy year for you and um, do you get um so like um i don't know um I, i'm not a musician so i can't really tell but do you sometimes get mixed up or is there sort of like a particular mindset? <laughs> okay, this, this time i'm gonna be gene loves jezebel now i'm not the alarm anymore but i'm gonna be do you go into that yeah you just have to change that? you just have to change your, you just have to change your shirt or your jacket <laughs> you just have to make sure you got the right jacket on trust me <laughs> there was a there was um there, there was an, a, an interesting time but um, about six weeks ago because I was in rehearsals with the alarm, but I was also learning the Bowie stuff. So I'd be in rehearsals in the alarm in the day and then I would be learning the Bowie stuff at night. And that was my brain filled up a little bit too much at that point. And so just to let you know, uh, Gene Loves Jezebel starts in three weeks and I haven't even started learning that yet. That starts tomorrow. So... Um, so I'll, they're sending me the tracks today, so I'm going to start learning it tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah. Well, I am going to go and see Jean Loves Jezebel as well. That's on the twenty third. I'll buy you. Oh, yeah. I'll buy you a beer. I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> well, because I saw them last time at night, people. So like the same venue, but it was uh, someone called Joel who played drums for. Joel, them. yeah. Well, what? Well, what? Well, the only reason I'm doing it is because Joel lives in in America, it's and at the good, moment yeah. to get Joel over. And Joel's gorgeous. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. So he, he's, I think the way Gene Loves Jezebel works at the moment is I'll do the English stuff and Joel will do the American shows, which is great for me and great for him. All oh, right. So you don't go and join them when they tour America. You just saw, like do it for the No, UK. Joel. Yeah. I, yeah. I, and, and Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's brilliant. So, um, John Kidd said that he'll see you at Manchester Ritz. That's on the 15th as well. That's for, um, I think, the alarm. So, see you there, John. And, see you there. Yeah. Cool. And Roel Marasigan said that's great story. I think that was a like, great story about Bruce Poxton. Um, you, mentioned, <laughs> um, you mentioned Archive. Um, earlier before we, uh, went on, uh, before we went live, um, I told you that this is a band that I have no idea um, I haven't got a clue who they are, but when I looked them up, they've been around since 1994. And uh, yeah. their discography is just so, like, they've done so many albums and so many things, and they've yeah. got a new album coming out this year as well. So um, can you yeah. tell us more about um, Archive for for people like me? Well, they're, kind of, they're kind of... Well, they're, they're, they're kind of like the best-kept secret in music for me. But in certain territories, they're a British band, but in certain territories like France and Poland and Russia and all this, they're huge. They're, they're you know, they're arena sized band, you know. And then, so when we play in Europe, we'll, we'll you know, the, the tours sell out, but in the UK, they're pretty unknown. They've never had a, what you would call a hit, which is probably a good thing actually, which means they're, they've still got amazing credibility. But it's one of those bands, if you go back and you, you open up Narnia and open up the, the box, you'll be astonished at the musicality of that band. They are like a cross between Pink Floyd, Massive Attack and Radiohead, all in a little gorgeous shaped box. And, and, and if you're a music fan, I urge you to try, check out Archive because they are astonishing, really. Wow. That's yeah. I'm definitely going to sort of, like check them out because I didn't get a chance to sort of, like do that last night because I thought I'm gonna listen to oh, at least great. one two song so I, I could sort of like ask you about them, but I just didn't get a chance. So yeah, um, yeah so do check out um, all the music fans out there. Do check out Archive. Um, yeah, and you're gonna be uh, touring with them 
uh, in August in Europe as well. So are there any sort of like UK, is there a UK tour as well or is it just a no. European? There's one, there's one, one London show apparently at the end of November. So oh, there just you go. London. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Um, um, John Kidd uh, said, which songs, if any, from the vast amount you have learned have been particularly difficult to master or does it come easy? Well, actually, from a recent point of view, Space Oddity was one of the hardest songs to play because it doesn't, it doesn't go where you think it's going to go. And there's all this crazy kind of jazz drumming going on underneath this exquisite piece of music which i it blew my mind when i tried and, and you've got Visconti standing next to me playing all this incredible bass and i just i all i did was say to the say to the sound man i i took a second snare and i tuned it out really high and i said to to him just stick a ton of reverb on this snare just for space oddity so I'll be going, he kind of be going, ground control to my Ujid song, and I'll be going, brat, 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 and, this, and it was just going <laughs> around the room every time I just touched this snare drum. And then all my friends were going, man, that sound was amazing. Where'd you come up with that idea? I said, well, I don't know. I just wanted, I thought it'd be really cool. But the rest of it's like really delicate, like you're just touching the toms, and oh, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, right, so Roel said that um, he's searching archive in Spotify now. Well done, yeah, that's that's good. So um, good luck yeah, with that. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> all these bands that you played in and all these sort of like uh, amazing musicians and artists that you played for, is there still a band or an artist that you would like to sort of like? play drums uh for play drums in oh there's loads oh there's loads i i, I just I, I i love playing drums for people and and i yeah. it really doesn't matter who it is as long as there's something great about them and i i i, I recently did what did i do i did i did like a really weird week where i had the most weird swing of, 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 of artists where I, I kind of recorded with this really cool French avant-garde filmmaker called Robin Foster. And it was all very cool and avant-garde. And then the next day I played at Butlins with Owen Paul. Right? <laughs> and then, and then I did it. I know, I know. And it was like the maddest yeah, thing. And then I did. Favorite, I did, I did waste of time. Is yeah, that my favorite? Yeah. So I did that. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then the next day, this was this was it. This is my crazy week. And then the next day, I I recorded a track for some like thing in America that was like really crazily like out there. And then the next day, I did a gig with Mark Butcher, the England Test cricketer, who's now a singer songwriter. That was my four days the other day. And I was like, when people go, my, and then my dad will ring me and go, "What are you doing this week?" And I go, "Well." It's quite a good week, Dad. You'll like this one. <laughs> Just, and that's, but that's the great thing about it. It's that music's music. It's all so yeah. different, but it's all the same. Like good music is good music, and it doesn't matter. And I think that's the thing. You mustn't pigeonhole people. Like even for your, like, if, like I'm saying to you, take that for instance, right? Well, <laughs> now your snobby musician, your snobby musician will say, "Oh God, can't stand take that." Well, I'll tell you now, take that wrote some brilliant songs, right? It's they also nice. wrote some terrible songs. But, <laughs> but, they had, but as a songwriter, like, like you know, everybody wants to rule the world or whatever. Well, I can't remember what it was called, you know. Um, but G Gary Barlow knows how to write a tune, man, you know. And, and I think you have to be open to that. You can't just love Radiohead, you know. It's like you've got to be open and that was a great thing about Taylor Hawkins. Taylor Hawkins just loved music. Everything, every interview I've watched this week of Taylor, is, he just loved music, you know? And I think yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the great thing about, and everybody should be like that. I think it's really important that you should just love, doesn't matter who's doing it. If you like yeah. it, love it, you know? 
But on the other hand, though, is there a particular sort of like type of music, or is there someone who asks you to do drums for them, but you sort of like said no because I'm not into that kind of music? Or have you ever done that? Uh, I've never no? said no. I've never said no. I might have. I might have said no after one show and gone. I've done some crazy stuff. I've done some stuff yeah. where I've done a tour. I've done a tour and gone. I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I, I've done a couple of those where I, I've done it and I haven't done it a second one because oh, right. I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. But yeah. I'm not going to tell you who it was. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. Okay, I'm not going to ask. Um, no, no, so, no, don't um, ask. Don't ask. I don't know. Um, right. Well, there's also one thing that I found out last night, uh, apart from all the music and um, the drumming and producing and being a solo artist, you are also an author. You've written a book. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I did. I wrote a book. Yeah. I wrote, was... a book. I wrote a book. Well, I was, I, I was, I was a bit, I was on an American tour a few years ago and I was a bit bored during the day. And, I, and it was with the alarm, and, and, and Jules Peters said to me, well, write a book then, if you're bored, you know. And then I just suddenly thought, I've got so many stories, like, from, a, you know. And so it's a kind of a, 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 it's like me telling the stories of what I saw from being in a slightly privileged position, i.e. either playing with some famous people, or even, like, being in the next dressing room to people, or yeah, seeing... Yeah stuff that other people didn't get a chance to see and and other stuff it's just like stories of you know it, it's not about look at me aren't i great it's kind of look at me where i fell over or or drop something on the telly or something like that you know it's very tongue-in-cheek but people seem to really like it they seem to make, it makes them laugh so you can still get it it's called clang it's on amazon yeah it's yeah it says clang smiley drops a few so um yeah i'll show you look yeah. hang on hang on look i've got one here look there you go there, there you go it is. available on amazon everyone it's a great read trust me you... <laughs> <laughs> well worth it well worth it tenor yeah because um i was looking at uh, i was reading the reviews and also um read the synopsis of it it's actually the type of book that i would really like to have because being being a fangirl myself, I'm really interested in all these yeah. sort of like stories that you don't normally yeah. hear from, you know, from people. So I think coming yeah. from you, and especially that, you know, after this interview, it's like you've got so many wonderful stories about all, like, all okay. these things. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You see this one here? That's your copy, right? And I'll give you that oh. when you come to Manchester, all right? There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, God, this is just really, really amazing. I'm really enjoying this. I know it's nearly an hour now, but I've got only got a few more sort of like things to ask you. Um, like drumming heroes. Uh, who are your sort of like drumming heroes? Not just sort of like influence the the one that influenced you, but really the drummers that you really looked up look up to and you know like. Um, I kind of I I. I went through different phases with drummers. Like when I was a kid, I loved all the glam drummers. I loved watching like when I was a really little boy, like, you know, watching the sweet and mud and things like that, you know, David Bowie and all that kind of stuff. And then when I got into my teens, I really liked kind of Mel Gaynor and Mark Brzezicki and Simon Phillips oh and God, all that, yeah. which is weird because I, I don't play like any of them. And then, and then, in my late teens, I went back and got into Bonham, Ringo, Charlie, Mitch Mitchell, you know, all those guys, like the classics, the proper, you know. And then started, because I was playing in a lot of covers bands, I started playing a lot, like, you know, they, there'd be Led Zeppelin tunes and Police tunes and all that. So I kind of learned how to play like all those guys. And now, yeah. if you ask me who my favourite drummers were, I'd probably say... Steve Jordan and Hal Blaine and, and, and Jim Keltner and people like that. Yeah. But if yeah. you ask me who my favourite British drummers were, I'd probably say Chris Sharrock and Jeremy Stacey, you know what I mean? So Chris Sharrock, you know, oh my god. Everybody's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sharrock's, Sharrock's always been my favourite. Sharrock, Sharrock and Sharrock Sharrock took my job with Robbie. when I was doing Robbie, I I lost the job to Sharrock, who was my hero. 
But I actually know he's lovely, Chris. I've never, yeah, thought, you know, it yeah. wasn't his decision, but that was Guy Chambers' decision. But, you know, if you're going to lose your job, you might as well lose it to your hero. You know? Yeah, yeah. He's brilliant, uh, I, Cheryl. He's brilliant. Yeah, he's I, need, brilliant. I need to go and see Chris Cheryl because I believe that he's still doing this Beatles gig at the Cavern every Friday and Saturday. So he one is. day, one, he is. Yeah, one weekend, I'm going to go there just so I can see it. I know, I know. Have I haven't seen it yet. I'd love to go. I've oh, not been yet, been. but it's funny because Ian Mc... no, Ian McNabb was telling me a bit of a name drop there. He's in the book, but Ian McNabb, yeah, I saw yeah. Ian McNabb last week, and he was telling me he'd been to see it. And the funny thing is, Chris Yarrick's been doing it undercover. He actually puts a wig on, and no one's no one's known it was him. But now it's starting to sneak out, and all these drummers are turning up because they know it's Chris. So yeah, that's quite, yeah. I can't, yeah, that's quite funny. All the well, all the I Noel Gallagher he's... fans turning up in their parties. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's still going to do it now that people actually know that it's him. Because I remember when um, uh, name drop, name drop again. I remember when Ian McNabb told me about. It. I thought he was just pulling my leg because he said, "Oh, if you want to meet Chris Sharrock, go to the cavern on the weekend, the Friday yeah, or Saturday, yeah. and you'll see him there." And then he said yeah. that with the with the Ringo Star nose and a Ringo Star wig, and, and I was like, <laughs> he, puts a, "He puts a fake <laughs> nose on." He puts a fake nose on. How cool is that? But yeah, he lo- and apparently he loves it. He loves yeah, it. Apparently, yeah. just like it's his favorite gig, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one day I will go and see him. Um, well, and another question I wanted to ask: Have you ever had? So, like, I noticed that you've got your thumb so like bandaged there. Have you ever had any like drumming disasters, like? Are you falling off your, I, uh, your joystick or... Well, the yeah, the, 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 best one, the, best one, <laughs> no, the, the best one I had once, was, I, did a, I did a live TV show with Robbie and we did Old Before I Die and it was the ITV Sports Awards. So it was a, it was a room full of famous sporting stars and, and we had to play Old Before I Die and we were mime in it and it was, um, and it was live on telly. And at the end... I saw Robbie turn around and he had this little glint in his eye and I was thinking, what's he doing? And he decided it'd be really funny to leap over the drums onto me. And he knocked me back and, he, and, and I hit my head on the floor and I passed out for about kind of five seconds and then opened my eyes, sat up and the band had gone and the, and the, the show had carried on and they were standing there going, and the award for best high jumper, and I, had to, and I had to kind of sneak, sneak behind. They'd all forgotten me. They'd just all run off. That was really funny, and I was like, I was like properly concussed and everything. It was really funny. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> As you do, it's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the... Oh my god. That was just. <laughs> It, it, someone told me it's on YouTube somewhere, but I haven't seen it. But he, he, I, got, I got a proper whack. He, he, he properly leapt over the kit and I went backwards and I hit my head on the floor. He thought it was hilarious. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, oh dear. And of course, well, what did he tell you after? When you finally saw... Oh, he thought God. it was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> he just thought it was really funny. And, and I don't think he realised how much... He'd, I'd hit my head and I definitely passed out for a couple of seconds because by the time I opened my eyes, they'd all gone. <laughs> the whole band had left. I was just me laying on the floor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 this is my last question. Oh my God, that's just... <laughs> I'm going to sort of like look it up on YouTube and see if I could find that sort of like clip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the ITV Sports Awards. Okay. <laughs> ITV Sports Awards. <laughs> Um, do you have any advice to sort of like aspiring drummers out there, like the young, you young ones? Just, yeah. You know, uh, well, I, I well, anybody who ever like, if, if, if mostly it's parents now who ask me, what am I going to do with my kid? Because she's really good, and you know, the best thing I can say is is, is to get get in a covers band because. If you get in a covers band, a good covers band, if you did what I did and you went out every night and for every song, you become that drummer for five minutes, right? 
So for every Led Zeppelin song you did, I became Bonham and I played like Bonham. And then for every Beatles song, I became Ringo and I played that way. And then so all those influences, I kind of took them all in. And, and, and so later in life, when I was doing sessions and stuff, when someone goes, yeah, can you do it a bit like Charlie Watts? Well, I know how to play like Charlie Watts because I used to play Brown Sugar and Jumping Jack and Flash every night. You know, so I know how to do that hi-hat thing. I know that Philly put in. And I think if you've got all that in your arsenal, it just broadens out your style, you know, and then for the song. So, yeah, getting a covers band, and it's great as well. You earn money playing with every night. It's great. Oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's a brilliant advice, actually. That's really good. Because do you know that um, sometimes people um so like say you know like all these um tribute bands and stuff that uh, sometimes yeah. you know you hear, you hear so sort of like music fans saying well why do you why do you want to go to all these tribute bands you know they're still sort of like they're not like the original or something but i mean i mean I, I I've added to sort of like, yeah, so i'm like yeah i've done a few trust bands. me Almost as good as I've, I've done a few of those tribute bands. <laughs> the, those tribute, those tribute acts. They know those artists better than you think. And I, I even, I even played for a Robbie Williams tribute because I knew him. And yeah. I remember my my over, and he really knew it. He really knew Robbie, and he had the, the mannerisms, and he had his voice. And I remember sitting there, and he, he came up, he went. Can I just say? And he had the Robbie voice. He went, "Do you know Strong?" And I said, "Uh, yeah." And he went, "Are you sure?" And I said, "Well, I played on it." And he went, "But do you know my version?" And, I said, and, that, and that really put me in my place as a as a tribute drummer because I just thought I played on the original of this tune, but he wants me to play his version, and, and it was just really funny. I was like, "Yeah, okay." I am. I I know my place. You know, the fact I played with the actual singer means absolutely nothing, does it? You know, yeah, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, after all this, all like a bit so busy, and yet you've given me your time. It, you're just so incredible. Oh, my I, I I really admire you. I mean, I I love musicians thank who you. can also be fans as well. They're not just so like you know the people we love but they also love the other so like musicians oh, that yeah. so, <laughs> so thank you where, where is this where is starstruck where is starstruck as you are you know what i mean <laughs> that gary barlow <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh brilliant oh thank you very very much smiley and have a great gig tonight oh, in um edinburgh thank and, you uh, i'll see you in manchester yeah. I'll see you in Manchester and big love to Mike Peters, Jules okay. and James Stevenson as well. And to you. Okay. Um, please Lovely. stay safe. All right. God bless. Thank darling. you very much. Yep. Bye. Right. bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Oh my God. That was so amazing. He's so incredible. Um, so looking forward to actually seeing him and the alarm on the 15th of um, April. 15 of this morning. I'll see you, John Kidd, um, at the Ritz. So anyone in Manchester or the surrounding areas, please um, do um, check that, check them out. And also, Jean loves Jezebel as well. They're going to be playing at night, people, on the 23rd of April. So do go and see them as well. Uh, but that's it for this week. Thank you all so much for joining us. And please do keep an eye out for next week's uh, guest announcement post. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be another awesome one as well. Uh, but, oh, my God, Smiley Bernardi is just so good. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, once again, love music, love life, and love, love, love drummers. Um, like, <laughs> I still can't get Thank you, Smiley. Thank you so much. And bye, everyone. See you next week. Bye.